God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your goodness and your grace by which we are saved this morning. We place this meeting into your hands that these deliberations will be to the good and best of our country. We pray for your wisdom to be apparent in everything that we say or do here, O oh Lord. Lord, we also pray for wisdom that will help these views presented here transcend these ballrooms into action and policy to develop our country. We pray all this believing and trusting in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Minister, the Minister of State for Planning in the Ministry of Finance, the Resident Representative IMF, I'm trying to be very careful with the protocol, so you will bear with me. Um, and I think a quote and CSBAC will come after this. Uh, allow me also to recognize the Deputy Chief Coordinator, OWC. Afande, you're most welcome. The Executive Director, Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment, um, Arthur Benomcha. The Executive Director, CSBAC, my friend Julius Mukunda. Invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I've also seen um, the managing director or his executive director. These titles are difficult, of Uganda Coffee Development Authority. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, looking at the program, it says high-level dialogue. So you're very important people because this is high-level. So to all you important people who are here, I want to welcome you on behalf of Accord and CSBAG for this dialogue in partnership with the Ministries of Finance, Health, local government and education to take a look at the economy under the theme economic recovery and reigniting economic growth. The dialogue seeks to provide a platform for different stakeholders to discuss the alternative policy options for economic recovery and put back the economy on a sustainable growth path. This dialogue that we are here for, that is being broadcast live, provides a platform for the launch of the National Budget Month, which aims at popularizing the budget and increasing participation in the budget process. We want to thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And this is being broadcast live on NTV. And to you who are watching at home and our participants who are joining us via Zoom, we want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. Without taking more time, allow me to invite the Executive Director of Court, Dr. Arthur Benomcha, to come and make welcome remarks. You're most welcome, Arthur.
now that I have sanitized, uh, I think I can allow me to remove the mask a bit. Uh, because these are matters of death and life, we cannot pray with them. The Minister of State for Finance, Honorable David Bahati. Uh, the Minister of State for Local Government, Jennifer Namuangu, uh, in, uh, in absentia, uh, she will be joining us shortly. The IMF Resident Rep, Representative Elizabeth Capriches, I hope I pronounced it very well. The Deputy Coordinator Operation Wellness Creation, General Angina. My colleague, the Executive Director, C.S. Bach. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have already been introduced, but I can introduce myself again. Uh, Dr. Binom Shaata, Executive Director, Code. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you warmly uh, to this very important high-level policy dialogue whose theme is economic recovery and reigniting the economic growth of this country. It is, our, it is an uh, annual high-level policy dialogue that we organize in partnership with the Minister of Finance and CSBAG, many years running now. It is different this time around because we are organizing it amidst uh, a COVID-19 pandemic, so we cannot even see each other very well. But we have to resist and continue to survive against all odds. Ladies and gentlemen, let me appreciate uh, first uh, Honorable David Bahati that in spite of your very busy schedule, because I understand that the parliament will appropriate the budget today, but you made it, and this shows the commitment that you have in the partnership that we have with you and CS Bag. I think you could applaud the Honorable Minister. And by 7.30, he was talking to me. Uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is also very important uh, uh, to see a Minister 7.30 is already concerned and he is asking you some things to make sure that the, the meeting goes well. It gave me hope that Africa has a future and we have a leadership that could uh, 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 take this continent forward in spite of the challenges that we face. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, as per the theme, uh, you realize that because of COVID-19, our economy and indeed economies of the world have been heavily battered. Our economic projection, uh, if it wasn't COVID, was about 5.2 uh, uh, GDP growth. But because of COVID, our economy uh, drastically fell to 3.1%, and the minister will elaborate on that one. So the COVID pandemic has ravaged this country, which is largely uh, 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 subsistence kind of economy. Every, we've lost about 600,000 jobs. And our service sector, which had peaked, uh, has been heavily uh, battered. But we have an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, uh, provided by this high-level dialogue, to generate alternative policy ideas together uh, that could help uh, reignite our economy and indeed grow at by a double digit. We need a double digit growth because an economy like ours, which is very small, a developing country like ours to grow below uh, 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 at 5%, uh, it is not good. Actually, we are not making any progress. So we need a double digit growth in order to make progress. But for some of you who do not know Accord, just let me make a, a, a brief uh, 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 a presentation about Accord. Accord is a public policy research think tank we are based in Uganda, but we work in East and Southern Africa, so we see ourselves as a regional think tank. We have a regional board, and our programming spans across uh, that region. Sometimes our programming takes us to Southern Africa 
and take us to, uh, to West Africa. So we are one of the leading think tanks uh, in Africa. Actually, the rating 2020, uh, uh, we are number one in, uh, in Africa in terms of policy engagement, but we are number one also in Uganda for the last seven years in terms of policy research and advocacy. Uh, uh, and I think that's something uh, to appreciate. Ladies and gentlemen, this dialogue uh, should help us to discuss a number of issues, and I want to invite, invite your minds to focus on these issues. We want to look at the implementation and financing of the National Development Plan 2, uh, which is actually a, a new kind of development plan, because Uganda has transitioned now from sector planning, budget planning, now to program planning. But also, the, uh, uh, we want also to look at the urbanization. As you know, that Uganda has established uh, about 15. Uh, 15 uh, uh, urban city, uh, cities have been established. Already we have seven that are operational. And we think that these cities can be turned around as centers of economic growth. And actually, in the, in the, in the recovery process, this could be very, very important centers of economic recovery. So. Uh, but you know there are a number of challenges. There are a number of challenges facing these uh, urban cities. So we want you to generate ideas so that we don't have cities in name, but we, need, we have cities that actually can generate economic growth uh, for this country and indeed uh, for the region. And some of them are very specialized cities, like Fort Porto, which is a, tu uh, a tourist city. Mbarara, which is a green city. Guru, which is a green city. Uh, uh, so we need to, to, to be able to focus on how can we make these cities a reality because urbanization is development. We also want to focus on effective debt management and sustainability. I hope the minister will give us the exact figures. Uh, COVID-19 has also pushed us into borrowing. We don't want to run into another grave. We also don't want to bequeath our future generations, our children and the children of our children, a debt like the US, uh, 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 the US is highly indebted. I know most countries are going to contract a lot of debt. And I think the challenges that we face, like most countries, is debt contraction, debt management, and debt servicing. Uh, that's something that uh, we need to engage uh, uh, seriously. And, uh, and the minister is here. And we also have technocrats from the Minister of Finance. Uh, we've been assured that we have not borrowed to a level where we can, uh, uh, which can uh, uh, reverse our progress. But here is an opportunity. We also want to focus on financing emergency response in Uganda. This country has faced a number of response uh, of emergency challenges, Ebola, Mabag, and now we have COVID-19. And we, it has forced us to borrow money. <clears throat> we need to be able to manage the, <clears throat> the money, <clears throat> to, to, uh, the, the response, but also the money that we borrow to respond to emergencies, to manage it very well. So that's also another, another area. We want also to focus on financing gender and equity interventions. This country, uh, in the 1995 constitution, uh, has recognized that we need to empower women. And actually, it provides that a third of, the, of all uh, positions of decision-making power in this country should be occupied by, by women. So uh, uh, we don't want that to remain a constitutional matter. We need uh, to, to make it uh, to move from rhetoric to practice. So this dialogue should also uh, focus on that. And I imagine that uh, the, the, the IMF representative uh, uh, will be uh, excited uh, about the, that, the fact that Uganda has achieved, has taken a lot of stride in ensuring gender equity and gender equality. So uh, without wasting a lot of our time, I want to uh, again uh, thank you for coming and also request you that as a code, we pursue intellectual freedom as an institution, we want you to honestly and frankly engage in honest con uh, conversation that could generate alternative ideas that the government could use to spur economic growth and economic transformation. Because for too long, we've been skirting around taking off. It's, you know, we're just skirting on the tarmac, and it's time that we take off. Thank you very much. I wish you uh, positive deliberations. Good morning.
if there was a measure of the state, state of the economy based on how we have clapped, then we are really doing badly. So I think we can do better. A round of applause. Um, especially for the viewer at home um, to be excited about the conversation this morning because it's only right that we begin this conversation um, as we count down to the budget reading. So allow me, and, and Arthur was offering context to this conversation, allow me also ask Julius to come, the Executive Director of CXBAG, to come and, and, and uh, dig into the context before we open up the conversation. You're welcome, Julius. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance, uh, State, for, State Minister for, for Finance, uh, the IMF uh, representative, and uh, the other development partners, uh, government agencies, uh, local governments, uh, civil society. Allow me also to recognize in our midst the chief, uh, the chief coordinator for operational wealth creation, uh, and also to thank Arthur, my colleague and friend, uh, for a good. Uh, uh, welcome remarks. I think this honor to welcome all of you to this high level uh, policy dialogue that seeks to pave a smooth, uh, a, seeks to pave a smooth economic growth and development path as the country moves to realize its development aspiration. You are all aware that Uganda has exhibited resilience uh, to, the health, to, the, to the health impact of COVID as we witnessed in the low numbers of uh, uh, COVID cases and death compared to other countries. Whereas the health impact of COVID in Uganda has been relatively minimal. The economic impact, uh, the negative economic impacts have been great. The anti-COVID anti containing measures affected different sectors in varying market units, but aggregate economic activity in the country was subdued in, and many citizens plugged into poverty. This is corroborated by Uganda Bureau of Statistics 2020 statistical abstract that noted that 8% of Ugandan uh, overall household moved out of poverty while 10.2 percent moved back into poverty. This therefore means that more people fell into poverty than those that were lifted out of poverty. Today is an opportunity to discuss key parameters that are central in aligning Uganda's subdued economy and enhancing social economic transformation of citizens. It creates a platform to discuss, to cushion the economy from predictable risks like, the dray, like to drain the, the country from projected desirable uh, growth trajectory. Ladies and gentlemen, prudent public finance management is central if Uganda is to attain her growth and development aspiration in addition to aiding the economy gradually recover from the devastating COVID-19 shocks. We need to find answers and workable recommendations to address PFM challenges, which include, among others, inadequate domestic revenue generation, rising debt that makes Uganda susceptible to fiscal risks, inefficiency in public investment management, and limited local government financing. Ladies and gentlemen, over the years, we know that our domestic, uh, our domestic revenue to GDP ratio has, up, has been at around 13%, which is lower than the average sub-Saharan Africa of, of 15%. It is therefore critical and important to ensure that we expand our taxation base. Instead of deepening, we should be looking at widening, we should ensure that we support local governments to collect even revenue on behalf of, of, of URA. We should be able to improve the rollout of taxation reforms. I would like to see the e-tax stamps, the invoices, and all these reforms trickle down from Chisoro to Koboko, not only in Kampara. We should be able to support Uganda Revenue Authority financially and also physically to collect more taxes. On debt, our debt apparently stands at 65.9 trillion as of January 2021, according to the Bank of Uganda. This has increased 16.7% in a period of six months, as the stock of public debt stood at 56.5% of June 2020. This shouldn't be a problem, but I think the cost of debt servicing is very critical. It's a challenge. Implementation of the projects funded by loans is still a big challenge, and our capacity to absorb the loans that we have got is also a big issue as raised by the Auditor General's uh, uh, office. Public investment management is central in raising government, socioeconomic transformation, and aspirations. 
Much as we appreciate the role played by different government departments, in undertaking several public investment projects, we note that inadequacies in implementation of these public projects is very real. For instance, the Auditor General's report of 2020 noted that government failed to provide counterpart funding of $3 million to Great Lakes trade facilitation. This definitely hurts the implementation of the project. My last plea is on increased financing for all governments. We appreciate the gesture of decentralization that has been the role of, has, that has seen the role of service delivery to citizens improve. Local governments continue to face challenges of limited local revenue generation, coupled with limited central government transfer. In the financial year 2019-2020, consolidated, uh, consolidated local government budgets had approved budget of 4.8 trillion, and only 4.1 trillion was availed by the end of the financial year. Limited local government financing plays uh, 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 financing paralyzes service delivered citizens, and as such, it needs to be improved. As we debate at this high level policy dialogue, our joint ideas and proposals for reigniting economic growth are worth considering. And the challenges highlighted above need to be critically addressed to achieve economic recovery and reignite uh, economic growth. I wish you the full deliberation for God and my country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julius. And uh, without wasting time, I'll allow me to request Arthur. Arthur, please come and invite the Honorable Minister to come and address this August House. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my brother and friend, uh, Julius Mukunda our partner and executive director, C.S. Buck, uh, for those remarks. As, e as an economist, uh, you gave us the figures. Uh, now it is my singular honor uh, to invite the Minister of State for Finance, uh, Honorable David Bahat, to give us the figures and give us hope as Ugandans. Please welcome the Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my brother. The country rep for IMF, the deputy coordinator of wealth creation, the incoming member of parliament, Katesh, who was our commissioner for customs. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First, I want to thank you for inviting us to this important dialogue. And I think these sort of dialogues are very important because we discuss and then have feedback as government on how we can improve our policy formulation. So I want to thank ACCORD and all other organizations that have come together to put up this high-level dialogue on our economy, on how we can improve our resource mobilization and other issues. Secondly, Mujisha was saying that people were not clapping and that could be an indication that maybe they are not making money or the economy has some issues. I a little bit disagree with you because you see, Mujisha, money doesn't like noise. So when <laughs> So when people are making money, you, you are likely not going to have a lot of noise uh, around. And also, I'm not going to be tempted like um, the director called was to remove my mask, because as you know, COVID is still rising, and it's important uh, that we keep the mask on. That's the only assurance we have, that we keep washing our hands as regular as possible, sanitize and keep the social distancing. So I'm sorry if you don't listen to me properly, I'll keep the, the mask on. So I would like to thank you for organizing this high-level policy dialogue on the budget. And on this occasion, I would like to highlight the following, which will be the basis for your discussion uh, moving forward. One want to know the focus for the financial year 2021 
2022 budget. The financial 2021-22 budget focuses on interventions aimed at policies required to sustain the recovery from socioeconomic setbacks caused by the, COVID, the world COVID-19 pandemic. It also focuses, and this is very important, on the transformation of the 3.2 million households engaged in subsistence economy into the money economy, and finally focuses on domestic revenue mobilization strategy. It's important to note that out of the 8.5 million households we have in Uganda, these are households, 3.2 million live in subsistence economy, meaning that two out of every five house, households live in subsistence economy. It's where our efforts are geared towards because we think if we can lift these households from subsistence into a money economy, then you increase your economic base, you increase your revenue mobilization strategy, you increase the quality of life of Ugandans, which is the ultimate goal of the NRM government. To achieve this, our resources will be invested in strategic areas that will secure Uganda's long-term economic future through industrialization for inclusive growth, job, and wealth creation. I also want to mention something about our macroeconomic outlook. Despite the setbacks of COVID-19 that drove our growth from 7% to now 3.1% in financial 2020-21, the economy is gradually picking momentum and is expected to improve over time with real GDP growth projected at 6 to 7% in the medium term. And we also think that we can continue sustaining low inflation rate. The projected improvement in economic activity is based on the potential recovery in the aggregate demand based on one, sustainable peace and security. And those of you who have been watching, we have been having a huge debate about whether we should increase money for security or not. And in the House, especially in the committees, we have been telling them that this is actually the base. If you don't have peace and security, you can't talk about manufacturing. You can't talk about education. So peace and security to us is a foundation, uh, foundational issue. The second is political stability political stability, and want to thank the people of Uganda for giving His Excellency President another mandate, the NRM government another mandate. By the way, we scored over 70% uh, of the MPs that are incoming. So we have enough uh, majority in, the, in Parliament to pass any policy that we would want to pass in the House, as long as good for our country. So this political stability is a good thing. It in attracts investments, it builds confidence in our economy, and it's what we are committed and committing ourselves to attaining in the short and long term, uh, and in long term. The third is better economic prospects in the oil and gas sector following the completion of the final investment decision last month. And also, we think that our public policy strategy of vaccination, I hope many of you have been vaccinated, those who qualify. There are people who were scared a bit, but I want to encourage you, if you are qualified, please do and get a job. It is very, very important. It protects you, protects your neighbor, and helps the economy. And also, to depend on our collective and personal effort to fight this COVID uh, pandemic. The Minister of Health Honorable Jenna Cheng yesterday told us that the numbers have started coming up again. So it's important to know that the responsibility to protect yourself begins with you before you ask government. And you can only do this by putting on a mask washing your hands, and social 
distancing. Uh, the force continued efforts towards infrastructure development and also dividends from our efforts for import substitution and export uh, strategy. Then lastly, food security. You know, our economy is one of the few economies in the world that actually sustained a positive economic growth of 3.1. You can check, and I hope uh, Julius and Arthur will be able to demonstrate, I've also seen Gobi here, that actually was one of the few countries in the whole world that sustained a positive economic growth, despite the setback of coming from 7% to 3%, but it remained in the positive. And one of the reasons that we think remains the positive was because of food security. People had food. As His Excellency President said before, food is one of the important things you have, whether in war or in peace, all of us will need food. And it did not only come like that. Part of the efforts of the NRM government that we put in place through wealth creation, you recall in some quarters, people were complaining that you are militarizing everything, including uh, food production and everything. But actually, wealth creation efforts yielded the dividends that helped us during this pandemic. We had enough food. The prices were low. Uh, so that helped us uh, to do that. And all of us remember, in March, April, May last year, you could only think about your health and the food, everything else. Uh, stopped, including going to, to discos and bars in the evening. We could only think about survival. In addition, the performance of the agriculture sector will be boosted by ongoing interventions geared towards increased production and productivity, while the service sector is expected to continue with a gradual recovery as the economy opens up. However, Despite this positive outlook, we are still faced with some major development challenges, including this that I've talked about, the upsurge in COVID-19 cases, the subsistence economy, two out of every five households living in subsistence economy, jobs, and malnutrition. The economic growth strategy for the next financial year is to continue to accelerate the pace of industrialization, building an integrated self-sustaining economy, continue strengthening of the private sector, and promoting inclusive growth through the various wealth creation initiatives like the Parish Development Model. Accordingly, the economic growth strategy for financial 2021-22 focuses on five pillars. The first one, expanding the economic base through productivity enhancement in agriculture, the development of oil and gas resources, and diversification of the growth corridors to ensure sustainable regional development and economic opportunities, especially for the young people. Prudent macroeconomic management, which is critical uh, to lessen the negative impact of the current socioeconomic issues. Enhancing competitiveness by addressing issues of agriculture productivity, the narrow export base, high cost of capital and electricity. Supporting the manufacturing sectors and small and medium enterprises by providing affordable credit skills development. And this credit is going to continue being provided through UDB, a Myoga microfinance support center. Uh, UDB, we invested, we have a plan of investing one trillion. So far, we are putting 600 billion. So we encourage small and medium enterprises that have bankable proposals to really approach UDB so that you can get cheap capital of not less than, not more than 12% per annum. Sustaining peace, security, and rule of law, fiscal discipline by intensifying the fight against corruption. And fighting corruption is the primary where responsibility begins with you and then all of us 
uh, combined, we can defeat corruption. The priority interventions for budget 2021-22 are therefore centered along the following areas. Enhancing value addition in the key growth opportunities, strengthening private sector capacity, consolidating and increasing the stock and quality of productive infrastructure, enhancing productivity, social well-being of the population, strengthening the law of the state in guiding, facilitating development, among others. But ladies and gentlemen, allow me to speak about one of the key strategies for the next financial year, for expanding our economic base and intensifying the fight against poverty, the Polish development model. In the coming financial year 21-22, government will invest 200 billion to start the implementation of the Polish model. This model is aimed at taking the whole of government development effort to the parish level. First and foremost, to lift the 3.2 million households living in subsistence economy into the money economy. This model will focus, among others, on the following pillars, production, value addition, and marketing mindset change, community statistical data strengthening, infrastructure development, and financial inclusion, where we are putting a revolving fund. And in the next uh, four months, beginning with May, if Parliament uh, passes uh, this today or tomorrow, we'll start a prior, uh, the prior actions for its implementation, recruiting over 5,000 parish chiefs in the country, strengthening and training the parish development uh, committees, and also collecting data to inform uh, the implementation as we move along. So we want now government, the whole of government, to go down to the parish. If we are building uh, water boreholes, would want a minister responsible for water to start talking about how many parishes out of the 10,594, how many parishes have I uh, covered? How many parishes have primary schools? How many have other infrastructures? And the money that we are putting at the parish is to help production and value addition. So we'll also work on issues of cooperatives, will work on issues of giving capital to those who want to process what they produce, and will focus on the 14, actually the 18 uh, commodities that we have identified that have market. One, one of them is coffee, so we are not going to be supporting every commodity. We are supporting those commodities that help uh, the economy to grow, that have market, that have high potential for processing. So the, 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 the coming years are very exciting for our economy. The coming years, actually, the next five years, we think that we can reduce the subsistence level of our country, which now stands at 39%. 2014, we had measured the subsistence of farming, and it stood at 68.9%. But when you put in other areas of non-farming, it comes down to 39%. Because you might find somebody who is doing a border border, he can only generate money to feed their family, but little money to invest. So when you put everybody in the loop, farming, subsistence farming, and other forms of subsistence, it comes down to 39%. And in absolute numbers, 3.2 million households out of the 8.5 million that we have, and that's going to be our target. So people will be having access to capital at the parish level, those who have what to do. They will be getting training. They will be, we shall be intensifying uh, mindset change and other things that help get them out of subsistence level. How will this budget be financed? So we've talked about the focus the macroeconomic outlook, 
the budget strategy for 2021-22. Now I want to mention something about the financing of the budget. Because Arthur told me I have exactly 15 minutes, and if I go beyond, please stop me. The financing of the budget. The budget for next financial year will be 44.7 trillion Uganda shillings and will be by financed by a mix of domestic resources and external financing. Domestic resources will account to, will be 22.4 trillion, 22.4 trillion, but if you add other sources of non-tax revenue, comes 25.1 trillion. External sources, 7.5 trillion. Domestic refinancing, 8.5 trillion. Oil fund, we are getting some money from the oil fund of 200 billion, and that's how our budget will be financed. There's an important issue that the whole public is uh, interested in and actually is concerned, the issue of public debt. I would like to use this opportunity to inform Ugandans that debt, our public debt, remains sustainable in the medium to long term. As of December 2020, the stock of our debt was at 17.9 billion US dollars. And out of that, 11.69 was external, and 6.29 was domestic which actually came to 47.2% of our GDP in nominal terms. Recall, we had agreed with the East African countries that to be cautious as we move forward, we should remain within 50% as a threshold. Kenya now, I think, is at 60. Rwanda has moved, uh, and other countries. And if you compare with what Arthur was talking about to the US, there are those countries that are actually in 200%. Uh, percent. So with the current requirements to finance the much needed infrastructure projects, because we have a choice to make, should we continue using the 22 trillion, 22.4 trillion annually that we likely to collect, and out of that we remove the fixed cost of uh, of salaries, four point something trillion, we remove uh, issues to do with interest and remain with something like six trillion for investment. Should we continue using that six trillion to invest the infrastructure that we need progressively and take probably 50 years or 60 years to finish all the investments in infrastructure that we need? Remember, you need a, a railway to reduce the cost of doing business. Everybody has, a, if you go around, the appetite for services is increasing. So should we continue, and I hope we'll get some responses from this a dialogue, should we continue to use the little money that we have domestically to finance our infra infrastructure, and therefore take like 50 to 80 years to complete them? Or should we borrow now and finish them and generate more money and grow the economy? That is the choice, uh, friends, that we must, we must make. So the choice we are making, we are saying let's borrow more money now, cautiously, finish the infrastructure now, because when you build the road, you take another 30 years, if it's built very well, another 30 years to think about the same road. If you borrow money to do a standard gauge railway, it will probably take you another 50 years to think about the railway. So think about this and also give in some, some, some suggestions. So the question is, should we use the little money that we collect and take almost eternity to build the infrastructure we need now? Or should we borrow and invest it now, generate revenue, grow the economy. Because when you build the infrastructure, you're actually building the economy. It's now easier to move from Kabale to, to Koboko. It's easier to transport the goods that we're producing in the, in the uh, up country. So that's a choice. And the choice we are making now, we are cautiously going to borrow more money, 
invest in infrastructure for the next three to four, five years, finish the infrastructure, grow the economy, get the oil out of the ground, and be able to balance our budget. So given the needs of the, the infrastructure that we have, loads, electricity, railway, to be able to lay a solid foundation for our economic takeoff, our debt level will go slightly above the agreed threshold of 50% to 51.9% in financial 2021-2022. And will come down again to 48.7% in 2024-2025. And beyond that time, it will continue coming down. And we are likely to see it after seven years coming to 37%. So that is the choice that we have made, and that's a choice we want Ugandans to understand. That's a choice that we are seeking dialogue in this high level, uh, dialogue organized by, by Accord. And I hope that given that we need all this infrastructure to be in place, Ugandans will understand. Much of the borrowing for the next financial year will be used to finance our infrastructure needs under loads, energy, petroleum sector development, and education and health infrastructure. And as we debate, some of you who have not been traveling up country, you need to move so that when you are in, the, in this hall, wall or halls, you are able to speak from the point of knowledge. If you now go to Bunyoro, you will be amazed what is happening there. You will be amazed what, what is happening there. If you move, so we are going to really uh, build infrastructure to all corners of the country. You'll be able to move from here. For example, in my own life, I used to move eight hours from eight hours from Kabale. But before that, actually, people were taking two hours from Kampala to Kabale. To, to, to Kabale. But now I use four hours. So if you are get sometimes, uh, if I said three, three and a half hours. I might report to police. But eh? <laughs> sometimes you can do that. So the saved time of man hour in terms of this infrastructure development is, is, is really amazing. We are going to develop our muko, iron ore. To do this, you need money to get the minerals out of the ground, the copper in Kasese. But the choice is, should we use our little resources to progressive and take almost eternity? to do infrastructure, or should we get the money now and use it to develop the infrastructure? I think the choice we are making is good for the country. Cautiously borrowing, but developing the infrastructure as soon as possible, and then let the economy grow. To ensure debt sustainability, the following will be the priority for us. Timely execution of loan finance projects to increase ability to pay back and hasten realization of the expected gross dividends. If you're an accounting officer, why should you take time to sign something on your desk when you know that's going to impact gross? I normally tell people in the Ministry of Finance that any minute you take with the paper, you are not delaying your minister, you are not delaying a department, you are delaying gross. You are delaying growth because every action that we take impacts on our economic growth. So we are saying if you're an accounting officer and you are being dilly-darling, you keep delaying with these projects, what you have no place in government. You can either join the public sector or you can be sacked and move on. Because imagine the procurement delays that happened to Karuma. Because Karuma was one of the key projects to sort out the issue of electricity. But it took two and a half years to finish procurement. You have a, a, a development plan of five years, key projects to be implemented, take two and a half years to be procured. So to banish these demons of delays, especially in procurement, we are saying if you're an accounting officer, you are not taking timely decisions, you are delaying growth, you are delaying the economic future of our country, we are going to suck you. Contracting loans on concessional terms. 
our structure has been out of 100 shilling that we borrow, 85 should be on concessional terms and 15 should be on, on, on domestic, on, on, on commercial terms. Now, there are things that we cannot borrow externally, especially budget support. And I can see the country rep of IMF here. We want to thank them. Gradually, they are appreciating that we need money for budget support, and therefore we have got some facilities uh, from them. So, but borrowing domestically has been one of the challenges because it's a bit expensive to borrow domestically. The Gobis and uh, others have been arguing that you overcrowd the private sector. But the evidence actually is not in your favor because the evidence shows that despite our borrowing from the domestic, you still continue to have more liquidity lying in the banks, in the commercial banks. And the figures speak to themselves. So why is it that banks are holding on their liquidity. Why? I think we needed to, we needed to, to question that, you policy analysts. Why is it that they are continue to hold on those, that liquidity? So borrowing it domestically can overcrowd the private sector, but it's not the only factor that's affecting this. There are other factors that we need to interrogate. We are also looking at diversifying our financing options and matching the nature of borrowing to specific projects. So we want commercial loans to go for projects that generate income. And then non-concession will go for social uh, economic uh, development. So in conclusion, because I have now one minute remaining, in conclusion, therefore, I would like to emphasize that the development strategy for financial 2021-22 aims at maintaining peace and security, accelerating industrialization, building an integrated self-sustaining economy, increase domestic revenue mobilization to reduce reliance on debt. That's very, very, very important because our independence, financial independence, and actually even political independence depends on the capacity to finance our own budget. Uh, debt, reliance on debt, focus on lifting the 3.5 million households from subsistence to money economy, and in summary, we are investing more in our public service to the people of Uganda, not less. We're investing more because we want to create economic opportunities for all Ugandans, not just a few. I thank you very much. I hope this input will help the debate move forward. And as, as I told you, we are having a sitting now at 10 to do the appropriation. I will leave, but we have the director of debt here, Maris Wanyera. Can you stand up for, you can see the, 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 the size, she's a bit stressed by, <laughs> by this issue, so don't stress her a lot. <laughs> so I thank you, thank you very much, and God bless you. Another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for the state minister. Um, actually, I heard him say it used to take him two hours. He actually needed, he was saying two days. It used to take him, us two days to come from Kamale, for those of us. And for me, I come from Father Kisoro. So I probably needed three days to get here um, before 1990. And now, uh, my people, you can actually fly to Kisoro. I, I needed to mention that. In 45 minutes, you can arrive at the Nyakabande airfield. Uh, my managing director, UCDA, is here. He confirms. And uh, you will be able to see the gorillas in, in an hour after you have landed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to quickly move. We will have a very uh, quick panel discussion shortly. But I wanted to introduce the conversation with one of our panelists and allow me invite. This is the very, I'm not sure if this is your first engagement after you came, 
but this is probably the first time we're all seeing the new IMF uh, resident representative. And uh, she will, of course, let's show her some love as she comes to speak. Let's show her. Let's give her the Ugandan love. And uh, her name is difficult, but I want to help you because I've done this for some time. She's called Miss Isabella uh, Karpovich. Bravo. Uh, bravo, yeah? Bravo. Uh -huh. She's Miss Isabella Karpovich, and uh, she's the new representative of the IMF to Uganda. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me here. And like Mr. Bahati, I'm, I hope I'm carrying a message of hope, but also of work that lies ahead of us. Um, so I have prepared some slides uh, for these presentations. Uh, I'm an economist, so I feel obliged to show you some numbers. Um, I don't know if they are coming on the screen. Yeah, OK. Never mind. Um, I'll just go ahead. So um, Uganda has witnessed a very difficult year, as we all know, with growth halving compar compared to the past and unemployment rising, despite government's efforts to counteract the revenue shortfall while also fighting the disease and channeling resources to the population and businesses. The IMF financing and that of other partners helped but it was not sufficient to prevent poverty from increasing. We are currently undergoing a mild recovery. We are not out of the woods yet. For the fiscal year 2021, we expect growth to be around 3%, rising to around 4% next year, and returning to pre-pandemic levels of around 6 7% that the minister was quoting as well, from 2022-23 on, supported uh, by resumption of the external demand as the rest of the world recovers from the shock of the pandemic and leading to higher exports and the return of tourists. Oil production is expected to come on stream in sometimes in 2024-25. So how do I move this? Okay, I hope you recognize your beautiful Kampala on the picture. Um, Somebody help me with that. You know, in the IMF, we have all these courses about copyright and how whatever you find on internet, you cannot use. So now I'm going around taking pictures and using in my presentation. So that is from my backyard. So could somebody help me with? Oh, OK. So these are some of the numbers that I was talking about. You see some uh, initial signs of the recovery. Uh, business tendency indicators are gradually picking up, and the private sector, uh, lend lending to private sector is also increasing. Um, the legacy of the crisis is yet to crystallize fully. When some support measures that are currently in place are relaxed and the effect on social outcomes, including education, is quantified. For the time being, we can take stock of what is visible, fiscal deficits and debt, and prepare to take action. The fiscal impact of the crisis is profound and will take some time to unwind. In fiscal year 1920, the deficit reached 7.2% of GDP. It's expected to widen by an additional 2% of GDP this year. Um, going forward, Fiscal deficits will narrow as the recovery strengthens. Debt will increase this year above 50% of GDP, but will remain sustainable. And I like to underscore this in line with what the minister said. It will come down gradually over the medium term as fiscal consolidation and stronger growth resume. What to do going forward? Post-COVID-19, the return to fiscal consolidation should be accompanied by structural reforms. These reforms should focus on generating inclusive growth and enhancing private sector and human capital development, including through strengthening public financial management and governance frameworks. Uh, you have probably, probably already heard that the 
government is discussing with the IMF um, a financial program uh, that will support the government reforms over the next three years. Here in this slide, you see some of the, the pillars of these programs, which you will recognize also in your NDP3 objectives. Domestic revenue mobilization, it's a government objective, and it boils down to increasing revenues by 0% of GDP per year over the medium term. Other objectives are increasing spending efficiency through strengthened PFM and public investment management, as I said earlier, increasing priority spe social spending by boosting social assistance programs and also financing the delivery of COVID-19 vaccines. In addition, the focus is on financial sector reforms to enhance bank supervision and resolution frameworks and implement the financial inclusion strategy while also protecting against cyber risks. Governance reforms are at the core of the program and will focus on enhancing the effectiveness on the, of the anti-money laundering framework and preparing Uganda for the re sound revenue management through EITI reforms. This is what I uh, can tell um, for now, um, and, but I would like to add something about how we're going to finance, how should we think about financing the recovery going forward. So mobilizing domestic revenue is one of the pillars uh, I already discussed. Pursuing concessional financing remains a priority and the IMF program uh, falls also into this area because it will be highly concessional uh, and, and will in, embody a zero interest rate on borrowing. We strongly encourage the authorities to also pursue all available mechanism uh, to obtain partial and temporary suspension of the debt service on external debt going forward. And lastly, spend efficiently. Spending efficiently sounds like it is not, it is spending, it is not financing, but spending efficiently means creating preconditions for a stronger growth and stronger revenue, domestic revenue mobilization going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Isabella. Um, feel free to pick your, your notebook and take a seat at the front as I invite the other panelists, our friend, uh, the lecturer at Macquarie University Business School, Ramadan Ngobi. Uh, please make your way. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Minister did introduce uh, the Acting Director, Debt and Cash Management, uh, Ms. Maris Wanyera. Please uh, take your seats at the front. Another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. She's, she's managing our debt portfolio. She's a very important woman. We, we will be listening to her. Um, we also, representing the Commission of Domestic Taxes, is um, Ms. Julie Suba, Ms. Julie Suba is the acting commission, is the assistant commissioner, uh, business policy uh, under domestic taxes. Uh, round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Her, her size doesn't represent the taxes she's collecting, <laughs> so I, I'm, over, I'm also very careful to mention that because if you look at uh, Maris and then you, the, the two don't. Uh, all right, and uh, finally, um, may I recognize Mr. Gerard Namoma uh, from the Ministry of Finance. He's also here representing the Director of Economic Affairs, but uh, he's a senior economist at the Ministry of Finance. Uh, Gerard, you're most welcome. Okay. So we have a fully constituted panel, and uh, the, the, the context has been shared by Arthur, Dr. Arthur, by Julius. The Honorable Minister gave us uh, the poli policy direction of, of government, and uh, we did listen to Isabella, who shared uh, some um, er areas of interest and, and you know a position we, be, we should be looking at. And I maybe want to start with Ramadan, because Ramadan, um, unlike everyone else on the panel, um, okay, the others are civil servants. Uh, Isabella is our development partner. So Ramadan, unlike the others, you, you, you're an outsider, you're on the fence. 
uh, you teach economics at university, but also you've been, um, uh, an, uh, you know, an economist, and or, you know, and so you want, we want you to share your perspective on this conversation. And they've set the, the ball rolling for you. Uh, your reaction to the minister's address? Thank you very much, um, Maurice. And, and happy belated birthday. This was, yesterday was his birthday. Uh, he just turned 43. Unlike the ladies, he can tell us how old he is. He's 43 years old. <laughs> and we thank you for the surprise that you did <laughs> last night. Um, I would like to thank the organizers first, Arthur and uh, my good friend. They are both very good friends of mine, actually, the CS Bug CEO and the uh, Accord. The issue. Okay, doesn't have COVID. The issue of uh, economic recovery is critical at this point. And I think as a country in our fiscal policy making, we need to do enough to get the economy back to the pre-COVID trajectory of growth, but also be mindful of investing in areas which are transformative. I'm happy that uh, now uh, the Ministry of Finance is really showing some move away from the original view that growth will trickle down and they are very activist in the fiscal policy. COVID hit mainly four or five sectors, according to the analysis that the ministry itself actually funded an international organization to carry out an analysis. And I, I happened to also be part of that team. You know, here in Uganda, they, they, they hire the international people, then the international people hire us so that we can bring in the the real issues. We found that tourism was going to shrink by 43% as a contribution to the shrinking of GDP. 43% of our GDP uh, is going to come out of the shrinking, is going to come out of uh, the impact on tourism. Then we, number two, the trade wholesale and retail trade. Because me, I, I would want us not to come down to the real issues because I believe that's the economics which works. Wholesale and trade was going to contribute 26% of the shrinking of the economy. Then, number three, agriculture. Contributing something like 15%. And then transport and storage, contributing 4%. Now, in this budget, we are preparing how much have we cushioned these areas so that we can get them back to the positions where they were growing. Remember, these are big employers, especially of our median Ugandan. A median Ugandan in Kampala who has come out of agriculture is mainly employed in the informal sector in a smaller setting. How much is this budget which we are preparing or we have already prepared how much has it listened to the less represented voices in these sectors I've talked about because we tend to listen more to those who have a voice. But there are those who don't have a voice and they are the median person in the economy. Are we listening to them or just hearing them? The second, government was advised by this, and, and it's bad the minister has gone. Government was advised that 
in this very analysis. Don't worry, the minister has representatives here. I can tell you there's about five economists from finance who are here, so they are listening. Please, the people from Ministry of Finance who are representing the minister, and I you know you are the ones who generate the speech that he gives. <laughs> Please, in the analysis that was made, which is scientific, it was indicated that for us to get the economy to recover faster and more inclusively, we need to leverage private sector finance by investing not less than 100 billion shillings with the private financial sector to contribute the equivalent of at least 100 billion so that 200 billion shillings are availed to small, medium enterprises for them to be able to get capital at less than 12%. Banks were willing, as long as government the risks. We consulted all these finance institutions. They were willing, if government can de-risk using the SEF model, to avail 100 billion. They are also willing to get the 100 billion and give money to SMEs that employ at least five people to access loans at less than 12%. This is not provided for. Instead, we hear a lot of UDB. UDB is not accessible for this category. Then we, after you've defeated somebody on UDB not being accessible, they point you to a MIOGA. A MIOGA not for this kind of uh, uh, formalized informal or SMEs. A MIOGA they are for micro mm. and they have already been selected, those 18 A MIOGA. Some of them are politicians, others are uh, just people in the villages, some former leaders, then a yoga for, for, for some women, a yoga for some youth, a yoga for... A yoga will not fund the recovery of businesses downtown Kampala. We need a funding to support them. And that will be my main point today. Quickly. Is the fiscal stimulus designed in a way... We need also to ask this question. Is it designed in a way that is careful not to displace effective private efforts and creating what we call a moral hazard. What do I mean here? Are we designing the fiscal stimulus in a way that is supporting the right entities that need to be supported or we are likely to face the perennial problem of Uganda of elite capture. You know, elite capture is very live here. I've closely worked with the Operation Wealth Creation and a very good program designed and it has caused a lot of impact in several parts of the country, but also elite capture was the biggest problem of it. Uh, you see my man here of coffee, you will find that the people who are supposed to receive the coffee seedlings, according to government funding the 69 percent, whom they are calling 68, to those in the subsistence, to formalize, you find coffee seedlings going to MPs, coffee seedlings going to clerks of, of, of these townships, going to business people, and at the end of the day, you can get so many bags of coffee, but when they are being produced by the elite, you haven't solved the problem that you wanted to solve, Inclusion. of getting people out of subsistence. So we need to be very careful with this one. And finally, you know, um, the minister commented on something, and I would want to end with this. The issue of... Uh, of debt. 
because when you, you don't talk about debt, my good friend uh, Arthur will not be happy and see us back. <laughs> um, he's saying that he's giving us a very hard choice to, to make. Should we use the money that we have to fund our infrastructure so that we can finish them in a hundred years? Or we borrow more and we fund them in the medium term? Um, I know that this is a real actual question, policy question. But we need to work on the issues which Isabel has talked about. And that's where the, the concern has been. Number one is the project implementation. Why do these bureaucrats fear to make decisions? Why are they slowing the implementation, the delays? We did a research and we have a paper which actually shows why implementation is failing in Uganda. Why bureaucrats, especially the street level bureaucrats, do not take decisions. Everybody is consulting. You find the commissioner in the ministry has to first consult the director. The director consults the PS. The PS consults the minister. The minister consults cabinet. Cabinet is consulting the president. The president is also consulting the people. <laughs> so you find that decision making is very slow. And this has to be... Ramadan, I thought that's what we wanted. A bottom... <laughs> A bottom-up approach. Only, only that the, the bottom will, will come at the, at the, the end. The second one is the corruption. The corruption issue, we are just talking about it as if it is a normal business, you know, or is not yet in a crisis or ICU level. Uganda, we must say enough is enough to the corrupt. They are the ones derailing us. They are the ones who are making people not trust government that because Uganda has a debt is among the lowest in the region and in the world. All but right. everybody is so obsessed with it, mainly because people are not trusting that the money you are borrowing, you are going to put it to the proper use you are, you are indicating in your paperwork. All and right. lastly, the fiscal indiscipline, which she, Isabella was talking about as the efficiency in the financing, in, in the spending. Fiscal indiscipline is back. This government made the economy to recover so fast in the 90s by restoring the fiscal discipline. The year was 1992. When the president said, if it means that all of us are going to walk, we are going to walk. But this kind of expenditure is not acceptable. Now, the government is growing. There are so many cars you saw on the road with the red number plates and the blue number plates. People are just loitering around, spending a lot of money on things which are not adding to the GDP and the value of Ugandans. All right. That fiscal indiscipline has to be addressed. Ramadan, I thought you'd be happy. We are merging the agencies. So that is part of the, the, Thank the, you. the solving of the problem. Thank you very much, Ramadan. Unfortunately, I don't have all the time Ramadan had for each and every one of you. So please uh, be a little more uh, brief. Uh, I, I think Ramadan needed to set the tone. And I guess you get the tone. He is speaking as a Muntua 1C. I'm not sure he, he is a Muntua 1C, but uh, he lectures the Muntua 1C. And, and uh, he listens. I'm not sure he's just hearing, but he listens. Um, and, and it would be nice to capture his, his conversation. And so I'll come to you, Maris, because he spoke to that. Maybe Isabella set the tone better for you by saying uh, it's not as bad as we think it is. And so let's begin there. First of all, is our debt sustainable? Uh, given that uh, half of our domestic revenue collected is going to the debt and also the interest on the debt. Is this sustainable? Feel Thank free to you. even carry it. It is yours. No one else is okay. going to touch it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank all those uh, who have presented before me. Uh, I thank uh, the organizers also for inviting us to this meeting. Um, I want to say that um, 
debt, our debt is indeed uh, sustainable. Um, as of now, as of today, I don't think uh, we've had any, any concern from our creditors complaining of us not having service to their debt. So we meet our debt in a very timely manner and uh, we've not been, we've not, and we don't think we're going to default. Uh, and uh, maybe I should say, why is it sustainable? The minister already and, uh, and uh, Isa have already indicated where we are going in as far as this, financial, this coming financial year is concerned. Um, the reasons are very clear to all of us that uh, Uganda, like many other countries, has been affected by COVID. And because of that, the economy slowed down. We performed better than others. Others went to negative, but uh, it still grew at 3.1 for this financial year. We're projecting 3.1 as an outturn. Uh, but uh, because of that, our revenues also uh, declined. And we had to continue to deliver the services that are needed. And therefore, the increase in uh, budget support financing to, 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 to cover the gap that was created by the effects of the pandemic on the economy. So we've seen our debt growing largely because of that. Starting last financial year, uh, we had to approach uh, World Bank and IMF to support the budget. We went a little bit in the domestic market also, and the same will happen this coming financial year. But uh, we, 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 given our projection uh, of uh, growth, we see this position, this situation turning around. Um, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, the position will improve uh, come 2022, 23. Let me go down to the levels that the minister mentioned earlier. So to give assurance that uh, we are going to remain sustainable, uh, in terms of the debt management, because that is very important that uh, we give you assurance that we are observing and, and ensuring that uh, we remain sustainable. We have, we are doing everything, our borrowing is within the, the legal framework, in this case the constitution, and uh, that is Article 159 and the Public Finance Management Act. We are following that process so that we don't bring in debt that is not uh, properly approved. But in addition to that, we have our public, uh, public debt management framework. It guides on how we are going to be borrowing. And uh, this is the 2018 framework. It will go on until next financial year. It guides us on how we should, what kind of financing we should be sourcing, uh, for what purpose. So it is clear that uh, for budget support, uh, we should look for concession of financing. And where we fail, that's when we go for the non-concession financing. For infrastructure development, uh, depending on the nature, energy projects, we are looking at concessional or semi-concessional because of the level, the high level of return. Then for social sectors, we do concessional largely for education, health, agriculture, because th these resources are still available uh, from our development partners. We can still access it as Uganda. We also have our medium term, medium debt management strategy, medium term debt management strategy. It guides us on the composition. How do you, what kind of financing are you going to source for a given year? And like for next financial year, it tells us how much we should raise in terms of concessional terms and how much we should raise in terms of uh, non-concessional. And it also guides us on the risk on the risk aspects, how do we mitigate? We do long-term financing in order to reduce on the refinancing risk. And then less of commercial because that has a, a problem on the liquidity ratio. So that is in place. And then we do, uh, we have the public finance management strategy, just, uh, yes, public finance management systems strategy. This is addressing uh, what uh, um, Dr. Movi said earlier. This is helping us to really ensure that we have projects that are ready for financing. We don't find ourselves in a situation where 
we source for funding for a project that will later on be restructured because it was not properly designed and does not meet our um, uh, now we are talking about uh, program programs instead of sectors it doesn't meet our program strategy so that is what we have in place and we are rolling it out and it has it has really uh, served us well so far okay we we are also doing our debt sustainability analysis to check ourselves on an annual basis check ourselves these two years are because of the covid pandemic otherwise would still be below the 50 percent threshold now um in addition to that very we, quickly yes yeah in addition to that we are reviewing projects as dr ngovi said we have projects that are really slow very slow some of them are embarrassing <laughs> embarrassing so we are reviewing those projects with intent to either restructure and reallocate resources to those sectors, those areas that can support growth, or we may have to cancel some of them. All right. That is the action that uh, Dr. Gobi is waiting for, including making sure that accounting officers are held accountable for delayed implementation. Lastly, which would address the issues of, of uh, corruption in uh, case yes, it's, and, uh, the, it's one of the bottlenecks. Yes. yes. Uh, lastly, we have the domestic revenue management strategy, mobilization strategy. And that's why uh, Julie is here. Yes, uh. to address the liquidity ratios. I mean, debt itself is not a problem if you are borrowing it for the right purpose and it brings you growth. But it also becomes a problem if you, on an annual basis, you are taking more of your revenues to service the debt. So we are pushing forward the debt uh, domestic revenue mobilization strategy to address that and it will help us in uh, ensuring that uh, we are not really um, constraining social services okay. at the expense of debt money. All right. I am sorry I really have to interrupt you and I know Thank you could you. go on and on and, and it would be important especially for the people in this room and those watching us to understand what we are doing as a country to address our debt issues. Um, but I wanted to bring in Julie and it's Julie Njuba not uh, i mentioned something uh, julie njuba um julie i sh she's literally you know ended where you must have you must begin i don't know whether you shared notes and so that debt uh, that the whole domestic revenue mobilization strategy is where we yeah. need to wh what's that strategy what is it you're putting in place to move us from half your money going to debt and you know debt and its interest to at least less than that if you can increase uh, the, the basket oh. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. Protocols all observed. Um, of course, my previous, the previous speakers all mentioned the domestic revenue mobilization strategy. And as Uganda Revenue Authority, we feel that we cannot do this alone. Definitely, it's all coming from the people of Uganda. And all we need to do is to put in place processes and strategies that will help the people who are actually paying taxes, all of us, to comply. And some of the strategies that we have thought about, and we really will call upon the rest of the populace to come alongside, things like process improvement. Um, we have put in place, we want to leverage, especially on the technology, processes like the digital tax solutions. I don't know if everybody has heard about that. Where we have, so far, we have six products, but come July, we shall introduce two more. Where are we doing this? We want all people to pay something. Many times, I know uh, the professor said that some of the non-complying, not not complying, but some of the affected sectors were manufacturing and, and other businesses like that. But some of these people, it's not because they didn't really want to, to comply, but their systems fail them. Maybe the end-to-end -end controls were not in place. So we've introduced things like IFRIS, what is the electronic fiscal invoicing receipting solutions, which will help us, not only we as Uganda Revenue Authority, to be able to monitor real-time compliance, but it will also help the businessmen to be able to control what, they, what comes in and what goes out and, con and be able to account for it 
properly. So we are leveraging on these systems that we are introducing within the Uganda Revenue Authority to improve our revenue mobilization. But also, you need to hold us accountable. So we are improving staff productivity. One of the strategies is to improve staff productivity and accountability through training and holding us accountable. Every person who has spoken has mentioned the issue of corruption. And um, when I was coming, you stated that my size was not an indication of the revenue collected. However, I wanted, I, want, I wanted to prepare them to, to, so that well, they, they don't believe that you are okay. doing as well as you uh -huh. yeah. So, So I know that it's a pain everywhere. And no matter what we try to do, if we have pockets of corruption, then this revenue will not come in. Will not come in. So what has URA done? We are not only improving the staff productivity through training, but we are holding staff accountable. And on this note, one of our strategies was to improve administration by the introduction of the assistant commissioner compliance division. There is a division that has been set to hold us accountable. Corruption is not in URA. Corruption is out there. It starts with an individual. So if there is anything that is, it has a tendency of corruption, there is a division with a clear hotline which needs to be escalated to that office so that we as staff are held accountable. You don't have to sit there as a taxpayer. They are robbing you of the tax that would have come in, however little it is, to build the nation. And somebody wants to take it for their private use or through greed. These people, we should, hold, we should be held accountable. And I include myself, because I'm part of URA. If there is a rotten apple, then the whole place becomes rotten. So that's another measure that we, we want to increase transparency transparency of Uganda Revenue Authority, so that all revenues will come in. We are also increasing collaboration. The, 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 the task of correct, collecting revenue cannot be done by URA alone. We need collaboration. We are working with our stakeholders. We are increasing sharing of information with MDAs, ministries and departmental agencies. We would like to collaborate. We want exchange of information. We are improving our processes in such a way that we are interlinked so that when we, we have information as URA, we can share with other departmental agencies. And these people will also help us to be, a, for example, government is the biggest spender. But you find that the people who are actually receiving the, the, the businesses from government are not on our tax base. They are, not, they are not even anywhere registered with us. So through exchange of information, integration of our processes, we will be able to improve our revenue collections. And then another thing that I want us to, to look at is our, enhances of our is enhancement of our processes. Some of our processes are a bit complicated, which does not reach the Omuntu Wawansi, like uh, people said. I mean you find that maybe our processes for registration are very complicated. We want to introduce simplified processes where someone can even register using a telephone, a mobile phone. Someone can pay their taxes at the comfort of their desk. And thank God, because of the COVID situation, I know it may not be good, but it has brought out the best. Now you don't even need to go out and reach out and we as URA, we may not go out and reach out to these people, but they can reach out to us. We need to leverage on this technology by also simplifying our processes, assessments. I know there is an outcry out there. Ledgers are not balanced. People are having all kinds of tax positions which create a problem for them to be able to comply. We need to simplify our processes to enhance compliance. And uh, my colleague from Ministry of Finance will talk about the policies. But some of these policies, I will just pinch a little. We have, I know that as, as of now, we have not hit our target for this year. This year alone, our target is 21.6 trillion. But as at end of April, we were at 15 trillion. That leaves a daunting task of about 6 trillion to collect in the remaining two months. 
And I call upon all of us. Yes, it, this is what is needed to service the debt. But if we are not hitting our targets, of course, COVID affected it in a way. And at this point, I want to commend the people who really complied and paid. Because despite the difficulty, some very good taxpayers are paying their taxes. We have introduced the voluntary disclosure program. Many taxpayers had skeletons of taxes in their past. We are encouraging taxpayers to voluntarily come forth. And when they come forth, penalties, interest are waived. And all they have to pay is the principal amount. Mm. All these are measures that URA is putting in place to ensure that we encourage voluntary compliance. All right. Yeah, Th thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, Julie. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I think the only person who was very uncomfortable when you mentioned that you may not hit your target was Maris, because then she needs to review her debt figures, because um, we need your money to be able to... Uh, there is hope. Uh, yes, to address the debt. It's okay. I, I'm not, it's not so bad. Uh, you know, Isabella, you know, uh, distressed us. Uh, she said it's not as bad as we think. I, I'll come to you lastly, Gerald. Um, and it's because I wanted you to speak some, some of the issues Ramadan raised, um, especially on having a more inclusive budget and, 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 and more inclusive policies that you're going to speak to, but also addressing how the policies of the next financial year are going to address uh, some of our current issues and, and are able to ignite economic growth as we are speaking to in today's theme. Gerard. Thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you, organizers, uh, for this opportunity. Just to, to begin by giving us con context of where we are coming from, Last year, we launched the Domestic Revenue Mobilization Strategy, which was geared to enhancing the effort, the revenue effort of the economy, because we noticed that we had stagnated for a while, despite, despite, despite uh, an upward uh, trend of growth. So the revenue growth was not in tandem with economic growth. You so continue that, reminding us of the Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that is why that we say, growth, how yes. can we put revenue on the same tra trajectory as, as economic growth? So we, we, we developed the DRMS, the Domestic Revenue Mobilization Strategy. Unfortunately, while we were trying to catch up, we were struck with COVID. Now, the DRMS was largely oriented towards enhancing revenue mobilization, but here we were, where we're in a situation where we're supposed to promote recovery. So we had to retune our focus of the DRMS, defer certain things which we had, we had wanted to do last, this year and the next year, and focus the DRMS implementation on two things I'll, I'll speak to, and I'll give examples of what we've done uh, for the next budget. Number one was to close gaps. The policies we, we've been trying to implement are not intended to impose new taxes. They are intended to close existing gaps. That was the first thing, which in our view speaks to the dilemma of having to raise additional revenue from a policy side without constraining recovery. Number two, we were, we were thinking about how do we promote recovery for those most hit? What are the most important things to do? Now, on promoting recovery, I'll give you an example of what, what we've done uh, for the coming budget. We are saying that for small businesses, in order to encourage uh, access to capital, and relatively affordable capital. We 
are providing an incentive to private equity investors, or what, what we, are, we are calling venture capitalists, that if somebody is investing in a small business, and we are talking about equity investments, equity capital, as you most of you are aware, is patient capital and relatively cheaper than debt, debt capital. So we are saying that if somebody makes that kind of investment, they should be able to get out their investment without paying tax as long as they reinvest in another investment of the same type. That's a good thing because then it gives an opportunity that venture capitalists will be able to deploy um, a lot more capital in, in our setting. And they already established, say, it's a very active market in some of the, our neighbors. That's one big incentive we, we are providing this year in the space of financing the most hit uh, businesses. Then we, we are also retuning some of the taxes. Uh, for instance, uh, we had, uh, I think, Nile Brothers, they had invested in a, in a plant to manufacture a, a, a beer for the lower end of the market, Chibuku, what, what is called opaque beer. Now, the regime which applies to beer, if applied to that product, would negate their investment. And it was very, very important that we retune that regime so that this investment takes off. Not so much to promote, to promote alcoholism or drinking for that matter, but, but really that when they shut down that plant, a number of people were laid off. We need to get these people back uh, into, into employment. So on the first... Uh, aspect of uh, closing gaps, we've noticed over time that our incentive regimes are relatively generous. In fact, if you look at the last, the last uh, World Bank ranking of doing business, we had uh, the lowest tax burden in the region. So we're saying why why do we have a low tax burden? We've discovered that our incentive regime is relatively generous. So we've started plowing back of some of that, and we, we are doing certain things um, on some of the deductions people take, the capital allowances, and we are, we're not doing away with it because it's an inherent part of the design of the tax system, but we are slowing it down so that at least there is a fair share of of benefits for engaging in economic activity between the private investor and government. Finally, uh, I was about to tell you 30 seconds, yes. Finally, uh, moderator, just to mention uh, uh, this, this aspect of rental, because I've, I've had a lot of discussions, some of it may not be correct. The reform we are doing this year on rental is oriented towards creating equity between landlords who are individuals and landlords who are non-individuals, companies. The individuals are bearing a relatively higher burden of tax, up to 16% of the rent they collect, while the companies are bearing very, very little, very little. So this reform we are doing this year is, is will leave actually the individuals more or less the same. In fact, strictly speaking, the burden will, will drop slightly, but it will increase the burden for the companies or the non-individuals for that matter. Because why should they pay different, different rates? They're all landlords. I think that's a good thing for the tax system. I thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Gerald. I, I, I wanted us to conclude this conversation because we were looking at economic recovery, uh, interventions for economic recovery and growth. And I wanted um, Gerald's colleague, Davis Vuni, from uh, the ministry also, a senior economist, 
um, to, to share the other, because Jared was speaking specifically to the policy direction that the ministry is taking. Uh, and I wanted uh, Davis to also share in case there's other interventions. It should be on. Is the microphone on now? Yeah, should be. Go ahead, Davis. It's on, I think. Yeah. Of course, uh, first I want to... Davis, closer, closer to the mouth, yeah. I think that is... Uh -huh. yeah. First, of course, I'm from the Macroeconomic Policy Department. I want to emphasize, of course, what our macroeconomic outlook is like. From what uh, Isabella talked about, and of course, consistent with what the minister had said. Yeah, we have so many demands, but of course, uh, as they said, we have a budget constraint. Don't think that uh, much as we had uh, a whole list of projects and uh, lined up, we have, uh, we have a budget constraint and looking at our medium term macroeconomic outlook or framework, yeah, we intend to pursue consolidation. Where, of course, currently because of the COVID pandemic, you look, you'll see that our expenditure is almost 20, uh, slightly above 20% of GDP, but that is for this financial, this financial and maybe the last, but going forward, we, we are looking at bringing it down at least to less than 20% of GDP, maybe to 18, as we consolidate, so that uh, our director debt, of course, is not, so that we, you know, we move with her as she brings it back to the, the debt to GDP ratio to less than 50%. Yeah, of course, uh, there have been so many interventions. We, were, we had uh, an economic response unit within the ministry, and this was to help bring together different, to coordinate the different uh, special interest groups that, you know, we are meeting, because it was a consultative process. When we came up with a stimulus package, of course, partly with uh, Ramadan Ngobi, who was here, yeah, we had different, we had the people from the supply side, say the manufacturers saying, maybe we need this, cut, cut on this spending. But then, of course, some others from the services sector, for instance, who would want to boost demand, had some different slightly conflicting views from the other ones. So that is why we had to come together and craft, you know, a myriad of interventions, suggested interventions, but of course interventions that would lead to a higher multiplier effect within the economy. But uh, we identified the funding gap. It was so big. So we had to make do with what we had. Yes, so of course there have been some fiscal measures which we some people already highlighted, of course, also on the monetary side, the central bank has come in. That is over and above the tax policy measures. Yeah, I'll also speak to some concerns of Mr. Ramal and Gobi regarding allocative efficiency of uh, our budget, the composition of our budget, and how it can stimulate the productive sectors of the economy. Yeah, this is actually, if you look at next year's budget, um, of course, it's under the new programmatic approach before we had the sectoral approach. But when you look at where the 